first, uh, let me present the webinar in which um, we'll have it divided in two sessions. The first one, how to write uh, scientific papers. This will be led by Professor Dario Parina, and he will give a nice insight on how to draft from scratch scientific publications and how to give value to them. And then the second part of the webinar will be led by Juan Perez, an expert in, in European project proposals. And um, he will be giving uh, a major overview on the Horizon Europe program. So uh, first of all, let's talk about the Harvey New uh, project. I know many of you probably have heard of it uh, because this is the third webinar that uh, has been organized by the project so far this year. And it's an European initiative funded by the European Union and also the UK Research and Innovation Programme. Um, here in Hebrew Neuro, we have we are four partners, uh, University of Maribor, the coordinator of the project, led by the Professor Alex Holobar, Universita Politecnica de Catalunya, Salmes University of Technology in Sweden and Imperial College London from the UK. And the project focuses on development of hybrid neural uh, interfaces, which we aim to record electro electroencephalography, EEG, and also EMG through high density EMG. And we aim to improve uh, and develop tools to monitor uh, rehabilitation and neuromuscular disorders such as a stroke or spinal cord injury or Parkinson's disease, for instance. The goal of the project is not only to develop this uh, hybrid neuroscience uh, technology, and we will do that by exploratory research project, but also to promote the research in this field by organizing, but organizing uh, different uh, international events such as two summer school for workshops. With the, we've organized two workshops so far, one of them in London, one of them in Barcelona, eight webinars, webinars devoted to soft skills, we will publish a biomedical signals data repository uh, openly available for everyone in order to train and learn about this kind of electrophysiological signals. Uh, Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya will organize a mock a massive open online course on hybrid neuroscience in the in the upcoming year. We have also launched the International Hybrid Neuro Hub in which experts from different fields in the neuroscience field from both from the academic or scientific side, but also from the clinical uh, and company side, will converge in order to, to exchange ideas on the future and discuss the future of these technologies. And in total, there will be 12 national and international events uh, organized by Herbert Neuro. Don't forget to visit us in both the website and all, all the, our, our different social media because we keep uh, updated all the news about the project, the upcoming events, and also the dissemination materials and communication materials and teaching materials since this presentation uh, will be made public available uh, after the end of, of the webinar. I also want to take advantage of this webinar to announce our next event, which will be the summer school organized by University of Maribor in Slovenia. This will happen in July from the 8th to the 12th. So you are all invited to join us in this, uh, this amazing summer school. It's, the registration is free, so uh, students or young researchers, postdocs, clinical, uh, uh, personnel, anyone is invited to come. And they will only have to pay for the travel and accommodation costs since the inscription, inscription is free. And several topics regarding the heavy neural interfaces will be covered, such as surface and intramuscular high density and deep processing and recording, analysis of EEG and functional brain connectivity, also the application of these technologies in corticomuscular coupling, movement augmentation, and also some other uh, applications in practice. So please uh, take a look at our website, uh, use the QR code to, to register and take a look at the, at the program. And now I'm going to give voice to Professor Dario Farina, who is going to present the first part of the webinar, Scientific Writing. So Professor Dario, the yep. floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, Alejandro, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dario Farina. I am uh, uh, working in the Department of Bioengineering of Imperial College London, um, and I had the pleasure to discuss with you some of the aspects related to writing scientific papers. So, um, as uh, just to, to orient you in this presentation, uh, this is designed uh, for um, uh, people, students, uh, mainly PhD students, at the beginning uh, of their studies. Uh, 
where they are at the point of writing uh, their first paper. And so we will cover um, uh, quite basic concepts of what is important to consider when writing scientific papers. So for those of you who are more experienced uh, in writing papers, it may be still an interesting discussion, but you may find uh, some of the concepts presented um, uh, a bit basic. But uh, I think um, it could be an important discussion for everybody just to reflect on what we had to think uh, when we uh, publish uh, uh, and uh, before publishing, we write uh, um, our science. So first, uh, I would like to start with uh, science communication in general. So science communication uh, is uh, broader than writing scientific papers. So scientific papers is part of science communication. And uh, communicating science, uh, that could mean uh, writing um, books, uh, papers, uh, uh, writing in popular magazines, uh, and so on as uh, a few uh, important rules uh, actually that can be summarized uh, in this um, abc that i prepared the first uh, rule is that uh, of course it has to be accurate communication and um, it has to be adopted to the readership uh, uh, adapted to the readership meaning that uh, um, you have to write uh, in a way that is uh, best suited to the readership you aim at normally when you write scientific papers, as we will discuss in a moment, uh, you target uh, your peers, uh, so uh, scientists, other scientists, uh, but you may also write uh, papers that are more generalistic so, or uh, papers that are um, uh, suited uh, more for uh, uh, lay individuals. So to know your audience and readership is very important. The second uh, is something that uh, often, especially when writing the very first papers, uh, is difficult to, to achieve, uh, is to be brief and, and concise. Mm -hmm. Often um, uh, people tend to overwrite, to, uh, to be very redundant uh, in their writing, while uh, scientific communication uh, is best uh, when it's concise. And uh, obviously, uh, together with the conciseness, uh, you have also to be clear. Mm -hmm. So if you manage to achieve uh, this um, ABC, then uh, you have a very good start in terms of uh, scientific communication. In relation to that, um, I found some time ago very nice uh, uh, couple of sentences from the instruction to authors of um, a scientific journal, which I think uh, are very, very important to remember. Uh, basically, every time you write every single sentence uh, in your papers, and this uh, instruction uh, is the following. Write with precision, clarity, and economy. Every sentence should convey the exact truth uh, as simply as possible. So when you write um, your first uh, paper, or also your subsequent papers, uh, try to think of this uh, instruction for every sentence. Mm? And uh, you don't need to be redundant. Uh, if a sentence uh, is not needed, uh, you can easily skip it. Mm? All right, so uh, continuing to talk about communication in general, uh, what do you ask yourself uh, when you do scientific communication? And as I said, here we are still uh, on a, a general scientific communication discussion, eh? not specifically scientific papers, but all the possible scientific uh, communication. Well, the first question you ask yourself uh, is, um, who are you addressing? Hmm? You may address a scientist or specialist uh, in your field. This is the classic uh, uh, condition uh, when uh, you write a scientific paper in a very specific area, in specialist journals. Could also be a wider group of scientists. Uh, and this is the condition when you, for example, write papers in more generalistic journals. But could also be uh, different kind of readerships. Uh, could be uh, students, could be public audiences, could be lay people, and so on. So when you do scientific communication, you always ask yourself who you are uh, addressing. Another question that you ask yourself uh, in general when you communicate science is why is your message important? Why are you communicating it? Mm? And of course, uh, the answer to this question has to be evident uh, in your writing. Mm? You have to underline the importance of your message. Mm? And then, of course, uh, uh, a next question is what? What are the main findings or take-home messages? Mm? What are uh, the, the, the main messages that you want to convey? Mm? And, of course, you have to convey these messages in a technical language that is suited to your, uh, to your readership.
And last question you ask yourself when you do scientific communication is uh, how can you best deliver your message in order to satisfy the readership uh, abilities and needs? Mm -hmm. So how will your audience or readership uh, understand your messages, but also how they will use uh, this new knowledge? Mm -hmm. What kind of impact uh, this new knowledge uh, will have? All right, so let's say now that uh, we, we go progressively towards uh, the actual writing. Eh? You're writing your paper, and uh, the first thing you do is you remember to ask uh, uh, yourself uh, those uh, questions that we just uh, discussed, uh, who, why, what, and how. And these are questions related to your readership and, uh, and audience. Mm -hmm. And then before writing, um, it's important to start to make tables and figures of interesting results and decide what messages you need to communicate. This comes before writing, because huh? you need to understand if you have in interesting messages to communicate. At this stage, you even think of captions that can help uh, telling the story. This is somehow the skeleton of your, uh, of your communication. Mm -hmm. And then you make a general outline of how to deliver these, uh, these messages. So this is uh, uh, before you write, just to get uh, uh, to get uh, uh, start. And then you are in front uh, of the task of um, writing all the different parts um, of your paper. So now we are discussing uh, more specifically on uh, uh, scientific papers, uh, how to how to to write scientific papers. So here is uh, a structure that is very common uh, for uh, uh, the majority of the scientific journals uh, for a scientific paper. Normally, you have a title and title page, an abstract and introduction, methods and materials, results and discussion. Mm -hmm. So that's a very typical structure. In some cases, uh, you may have that some of these sessions uh, are not exact in this order. For example, uh, in uh, some uh, generalistic journals, you may have the methods uh, at the very end after the discussion. But in general, uh, you have uh, at least always these um, subsessions. Mm -hmm. These subsessions are, uh, are definitely the structure of the majority of, uh, of scientific papers. Each of these subsessions, we, we will go more in detail in a moment, uh, uh, has uh, a specific purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. So the title, of course, tells in the best possible way what the paper is about. The abstract uh, is a short summary, mm, standalone, uh, that the people can read and not necessarily continue to read the full paper. From the abstract, people should be able to grasp the most important information of, uh, of the paper. The introduction, uh, we will talk uh, later on about the introduction, is particularly important uh, because it has to introduce the problem, it has to introduce what is known in the field, what is not known, and especially what are the objectives uh, of the of this specific paper. Materials and methods uh, is uh, the description of what you did. The results uh, in simple words is the description of what you found. The discussion is the interpretation of the results. And the conclusions uh, implies uh, the impact and implications of uh, all your results. And then there are smaller sessions that are acknowledgments, references, uh, and supplementary materials that we will briefly mention in, uh, in a moment. So before you start uh, doing all that, uh, so before uh, you even start putting the very first sentence uh, in uh, any part uh, of your paper, uh, I believe it's important to, to, to literally make a checklist. Uh, and uh, sometimes this, uh, I, I will go through the, to the points that in my opinion are important to do before, uh, before you write. And uh, very often uh, I think people start to write uh, too early on uh, without having uh, checked uh, uh, all these items. The first, it seems obvious, uh, start writing when you finish your scientific work. Mm -hmm. This seems obvious, but uh, I've seen uh, a number of times uh, of uh, uh, students who are writing their first papers and they, they just start to write even before they finish their work, which is not uh, a very good habit for uh, a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. Then before start writing, uh, uh, since you have finished your scientific work, uh, I think it's a good habit to decide the authors and uh, somehow decide the journal. Maybe you can change the journal selection later on, but uh, choosing the journal implies uh, to understand what is the formatting, 
what is the readership. You remember we discussed how important is your readership. Um, and in general, which kind of scientific style or the details of the scientific style you have to follow. So choosing a journal, um, it's an important thing to do before starting to write. Similarly, deciding the authors uh, is equally important, uh, just to avoid um, any, possible, uh, any possible issue uh, when the paper is finished. For example, individuals who were expecting to be included in the author list and for some reason they are not, um, or vice versa. So decide your authors, discuss with your authors uh, the author list and choose the journal. All right, then uh, once you've chosen the journal, Go to the journal website, even if you know the journal quite well, and read the instructions for authors. Uh, maybe not line by line, but read the most important things. For example, there could be limitations in the number of words in the paper. There could be limitation in each session, how long it can be. It's good to have an idea of that immediately. Hmm? So there are cases in which uh, people start writing uh, 20, 25 pages, then they go to the journal they've chosen, and they found out that the journal only has set uh, six printed pages, right? So that's better to, to, know it, uh, to know it before. Then finally, when you've done these things, so you can start to brainstorm, to make notes on the different session that we've just uh, seen, uh, introduction, methods, results, and discussion. And start to make notes of which kind of things you want to put there, the messages you want to deliver. Uh, so it's it a brainstorm. Uh, uh, level and this is better, best done with as many authors as possible. Uh, maybe not with all the authors, but with as many authors as possible. And then you can start selecting material, illustration, diagrams so that you have prepared, uh, you remember, even before uh, this stage. So the most uh, informative um, um, illustrations that you that you have prepared. Mm -hmm. So this is um, a checklist of five points. I think these are important points to to tick before you start writing. So when you start writing your first paper, uh, just be sure that you have done um, uh, all these tasks uh, before. You will see that uh, it's very useful to have this task completed. All right. So uh, let's say that you have completed all those tasks. Now you start uh, what we call first draft. The first draft is normally prepared by the first author, who is the lead author and responsible for uh, preparing uh, a first draft to circulate to the, uh, to the other authors. Mm. I suggest a certain order in which uh, you do your work. Uh, of course, this is just a suggestion. It comes from my own experience. Uh, actually, many of the things that I tell you comes from uh, my uh, opinions. They are not uh, uh, definite truth. But this is the order they suggest, and I will discuss with you why I suggest this, uh, this specific order. So the first thing that I suggest you to do is to prepare a nice title page. I think um, preparing a nice page where you have your title, authors, uh, affiliation, uh, makes you feel um, already better. It's, uh, it's like you have, uh, you have uh, your paper on the right path. Huh? You have um, a, an initial title so that you can... Uh, you can already have a reference uh, uh, title, you have discussed your authors, you have your authors, uh, you put the affiliation and everything else in the title page. I think uh, preparing a nice title page uh, is really an important starting point. Mm -hmm. It seems a detail, but uh, as I said, it will make you feel much better when you have uh, uh, a very clean and nice uh, uh, title page. So the title page, in the, of course, the main information in the title page, apart from the authors, is actually the title itself. The title should convey very concise information about the topic of, this, of the study. There are a number of styles for titles, and um, there are no preferences. It's really something personal. There are authors who go always with a specific style, others who change uh, different styles. And uh, here is an example of a number of variations of styles that uh, more or less says the same thing. Mm -hmm. So for example, you can say the effect of arm position on myocontrol that delivered the message. You're probably talking about uh, controlling uh, with my electric signals, um, external devices, and you study the effect of the position of the arm. You can say something very similar, uh, for example, with a question mark, does arm position influence myocontrol? 
Um, or you can make it a bit more elaborate. You can say myocontrol in our position, implication for clinical use of advanced prosthesis, where there is a bit more information. Mm -hmm. uh, all these are, uh, of course, uh, perfectly fine variations on, uh, on, uh, on, on, the same, on the same kind uh, of a potential paper. And as I said, it's uh, your own style. You can define, um, uh, you can decide on the style for the title uh, in the way you, you prefer. Sometimes you can also be, um, and uh, I think uh, this type of title sometimes can be very effective uh, if you can include the principle, the main result, uh, or even the conclusion in the title. Mm -hmm. For example, you can uh, have a variation of the previous titles by say changes in our position decrease the accuracy of my control. So now you see that with respect to the previous examples, you are in the same kind of study. You study our position and my control, but in this case, with one sentence, you tell the, the main conclusion of the study. Sometimes these kind of titles are quite attractive for the reader because the reader immediately knows what are the final take home messages and maybe may be interested in reading more about, about your paper. All right, so once uh, you have decided your title, uh, and of course the title can change in, uh, in the subsequent drafts, uh, we, are, we are talking about the first draft. Once you have done your title, I strongly suggest uh, to choose as the next session uh, methods and results. So to write uh, the methodology and the results uh, with final figures uh, uh, completely before going to the other sessions. Mm -hmm. And I suggest to do that uh, rather than starting from the introduction, for example, or for the abstract, because um, in this way, you are 100% sure that you really finished uh, your scientific work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in writing your methods and especially your results, you may think, well, uh, maybe we are missing uh, this type of analysis here. And then you can go back, uh, add that analysis and add it to your results. Mm -hmm. But once you write your method and results, and once you are happy with that, you know that basically you have been able in your first draft to convey all your scientific work, and then you can go to the other sessions. Mm -hmm. Also, in writing method and results, uh, you are sure that uh, you can write, for example, introduction and discussion that are uh, precisely related uh, to the results in the way you presented them. Mm -hmm. So methods. Uh, what, uh, what does it imply to write uh, a good method session? Well, of course, you have to explain uh, what you have done, that's obvious, uh, but not only often what you have done, often you have to explain also why you have done a specific uh, procedure. Mm -hmm. There are a number of cases of uh, uh, papers that goes for revision uh, to journals, and then the reviewers uh, ask you, why have you done that? Why have you measured that? So try to prevent this type of comments and explain not only what you have done, which is obvious, uh, that, that has to be explained, but also why you have done that. Mm -hmm. So for example, here you have um, a sentence, we assumed one millisecond is the minimal distance between the tetra spikes, and then you can add a simple explanation, since this is below the absolute refractory period of neural cells, right? So if you don't have this additional subordinative, then um, it can still be fine. You, you, you deliver the information of what you have done, but then uh, someone may read it and say, well, why not 10 milliseconds? Why not 100 milliseconds? Why not, why not uh, 10 microseconds? Mm -hmm. So in this way, you explain um, uh, also why you have done that. Mm -hmm. Normally, experimental procedures and results are uh, uh, narrated in the past tense. Past tense. Uh? And uh, it's very important to uniform uh, uh, the tenses in your methodology and results. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you may also not use the past tense. Uh, I prefer the past tense, uh, and in the majority of the cases you use the past tense, but even if not, uh, at least uh, uniform your verbs in the entire methodology and results. Mm -hmm. So don't mix uh, present, past, uh, even future in some cases, just use uh, one, one tense. The past tense reads well hmm, because it tells what you have done. And this is an example. The skin temperature was measured every five minutes. You continue the entire methodology with the same tense. And then uh, you avoid uh, your supervisor having to re-uniform all the, all the tenses. Hmm. Of course, you may have mathematical equations and statistical tests. 
uh, in your uh, metal session. That's perfectly fine. In particular, engineering or mathematical uh, papers uh, are full of equations. You may have uh, papers that are mostly made of equations. And um, um, and then in some cases, uh, you may have some methods part that can be uh, described part in a previous publication. In that case, you may be even more concise uh, and you can uh, say that uh, uh, that kind of methodology is described in the previous publication. You can either describe it very briefly here or you can even completely, uh, completely skip it, mm -hmm. depending on how important that uh, methodology is. Mm -hmm. So results. So this was for the for the methods. And remember, of course, uh, the golden rule for methodology. I'm not uh, even indicating that because this should be certainly something uh, all of you know is that uh, the first rule for methodology is that uh, everybody else without any further information should be able to replicate exactly what you have done. Right. So that's the golden rule of scientific uh, scientific writing, in particular in, uh, in scientific papers. Results. So results implies uh, test, of course, uh, to describe results, but also figures and table. Mm. Uh, remember, though, always, uh, even if you have very complete figures and very complete tables that explain everything, that the test, uh, the descriptive test around figures and table is very, very important. Mm. Very, very important also for the narrative of your, uh, of your uh, paper. Results may be very, very boring uh, if you don't have a proper descriptive test around. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's always nice to take care of writing uh, your result session in, uh, in, uh, in the proper way. So these are uh, a couple of examples. One, one that is uh, uh, not, a very good, uh, uh, not a very good scientific writing. The results are given in figure one, full stop. That's, uh, that's quite a poor description. Uh, a much better one is to say the temperature was directly proportional to metabolic rate, uh, see figure one, right? So in this case, you have your test, you have uh, your descriptive, uh, descriptive uh, part of the results, uh, and then you cite uh, the figure where you will have all the scientific data and all the, all the numbers. Mm -hmm. As we say before, be sure that you finish uh, all your results, uh, figure tables, uh, including captions uh, and all the graphics, uh, before you continue to write the other sessions. I think this is extremely important. Uh, if you have uh, an incomplete result session uh, and you just uh, go on, then you may go in loops in which uh, you write the other sessions and you go back to results then because you forgot something and then you have to rewrite the other sessions and so on. Just be sure that you are happy about the results. Sometimes uh, even circulate uh, the results around all the authors to be sure that uh, everybody is happy about the results. And then you go on with the other sessions. Mm -hmm. Then uh, talking about the results, uh, that's obvious uh, that you have to present all the results that you have obtained, mm -hmm. including those that are not exactly fitting with your hypothesis or your, uh, or your theories, right? So all results are presented, have to be presented in a, in a scientific paper. Mm -hmm. So, um, and also be sure that if you have statements in the test, this is the same example as before, you have the descriptive part of the test that we have said is particularly important, but also be sure that you support every statement with uh, numerical information that can be in figures or tables. Mm -hmm. So this is the same that we have seen before, temperature or data proportion to metabolic rate. If you don't include the reference to figure one, this would not mean anything, right? It's just a sentence not supported by any numerical or quantitative results. In parentheses, you say refer to figure one where you will have uh, your statistics and your numerical, uh, numerical results. Uh, the results in statistical tests often uh, are presented um, in the test, in parentheses, at least the p-values. And then uh, uh, and a couple of more comments uh, on how to present uh, results. So one, uh, uh, important rule is that you don't repeat information ever. So you don't have uh, tables that are repeating the same information of figures. Mm? If you have a figure that represents uh, a certain set of results, you don't do a table that contains the same results. Mm? So it could be tables of figures. You decide what is the best, uh, the best means to deliver a specific uh, 
uh, information, but don't uh, be redundant, don't replicate numerical results in, in various ways. Mm -hmm. So figures uh, can be, of course, graphs, histograms, so they can contain uh, numerical results, but they are also drawings, photographs, for example, uh, you can have a photograph of the experimental setup or a drawing of the experimental setup. Remember that uh, in most journals, uh, the figures that you submit, uh, in the, especially in the final submission, is to be photo ready, meaning that they are replicated exactly as, uh, as you submit them. Um, and this uh, makes it very important uh, to select uh, the font sizes, the colors, and the design in order that the figures can be read uh, uh, properly. Normally, if you have two small fonts uh, or uh, unreadable, uh, unreadable labels, uh, this is detected by reviewers uh, or by editors uh, or later on uh, by the publisher, but it may not be detected. Uh, and so it's very important uh, that you have a proper sizes of fonts uh, and labels and proper colors uh, so that the figures can be can be read uh, uh, properly. Um, sometimes it's also useful to choose colors so that um, if you print the paper in black and white, you can still understand the figure. So these are nuances that um, on the other end may be important um, in order to produce the best possible product. Mm -hmm. Also check always the author guidelines. Remember, you check the author guidelines at the very beginning anyway, but go back to check it uh, just to be sure that you match requirement, uh, special requirement uh, for uh, format or font sizes of uh, of uh, figures. Mm. So some journals have very strict, start to have very strict policies, by the way, about the way you report your results. Mm. So to make an example, uh, uh, just one example, uh, if you go to the instruction for authors for the Journal of Physiology, since a few years now, the Journal of Physiology uh, requires to you, if you have uh, uh, an N less than 30, to, re to report in figures all the data points. Mm. So these are instructions from the Journal of Physiology. If N is less than 30, all data points will be plotted in the figure in a way that reveals the range of distribution. So you can have a bar graph, but the data points have to be overlaid. Mm. So this is just an example of how important it is to read, is to read instruction for authors. And uh, of course, in order uh, to have maximum reproducibility and maximum quality of the research produced, uh, many journals uh, are now pushing towards uh, having more and more uh, the raw data uh, available, even in the figures of the, uh, of the paper. Mm -hmm. These are still instructions for authors in the Journal of Physiology. For example, the Journal of Physiology does not accept anymore the standard error of the mean. Um, for your plot because it can maybe misleading uh, and request uh, to report the mean and always uh, a clear statement about uh, the number of uh, data points. Mm. These are specific instructions for the Journal of Physiology, but they are very good guidelines uh, for actually any, any other journal, even if not specifically indicated. Mm. Now, in basically the great majority of the journals, uh, you also have to provide a data availability statement uh, when you report original data, meaning in 99% of the cases, mm, data availability statement implies uh, how you will make your data available. If you make your data available uh, immediately at the publication of the paper, for example, in a public repository, or if you, if you make your data available uh, under request, uh, and so on. Mm, and take into account that some journals now require that the data are public available since the publication of the, of the paper. So this is another example of importance of reading instruction for authors. If for any reason you don't want to have your data available uh, right at the publication of the paper, be sure that you read the instruction for authors because some journals may request uh, uh, as an accessory submission of the paper that uh, uh, that public availability of, um, of data. So why are many journals going in, in this direction? That's uh, obvious. Uh, it's to increase the possibility, accessibility, and impact uh, of the research. Impact because if the data avail are available, other uh, researchers can use them, of course, by quoting your paper. And so this uh, in, uh, increase the impact of those, uh, of those data if they are used by, by more people. Of course, uh, the downside from the authors is that uh, 
making data available implies a bit more work because it implies a structure in the data in the proper way. And of course, uh, saving them in the proper format uh, and having some instructions to be able to download them. But all these things should be uh, anyway done uh, by default uh, when uh, you, you do proper scientific research. All right, so this is uh, um, completing our second task, which was the writing of the methodology and the results with figures. As I said, be sure that this uh, is complete. Uh, and uh, my suggestion uh, when this is complete and only when this is complete, uh, the next session to write uh, is the introduction. So the introduction um, uh, should uh, provide uh, some very specific um, information to the reader. Mm -hmm. And here I have written uh, a number of questions that you have, may have in mind uh, when you write uh, the introduction of your own paper. Mm -hmm. And these questions are a why and several what. Mm -hmm. So some of the questions you may consider is, uh, why is uh, your topic of interest? So you start your introduction normally by talking a bit about the broad field of research and why the specific uh, uh, aspect uh, that you have uh, covered uh, is of interest for that field. Mm -hmm. Then uh, what is the background of the previous solution uh, to, a spe to the specific uh, uh, challenge that you have uh, addressed? Mm -hmm. So what is the general background of previous solution? What is the background of potential solution? So this is a solution that may come in the future. What is the background of the basically state of the art or future solutions? And then uh, what has been attempted in your own effort? So given this background, what have you done? What have you attempted to do? Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, specifically, what will be presented in the paper, which is the objective of the paper that uh, often can always be hypothesis driven, right? So you can present what uh, you can write, what is presented in the paper by, for example, presenting a specific hypothesis, or in general, you can write your objectives. So that's the introduction. The introduction is uh, written, in my opinion, uh, quite smoothly once you have in mind your method and results because you know exactly what you've done. And so it should be easy to write, um, uh, to introduce uh, what you have done once you have uh, written it uh, in, uh, in detail. After that, uh, you have, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's best to go to the discussion and conclusions. Mm -hmm. So the discussion um, is uh, of a variable length. Uh, you, can have, uh, you can have papers with uh, particularly brief discussions and papers that have a very long discussion, but uh, at least it should contain the relation between the results, your results, uh, and your original hypothesis or objectives. Mm -hmm. So whether your results are supporting your hypothesis or rejected that, or whether your results have answered your objectives, have allowed you to reach your objectives. Mm -hmm. So this is something that for sure you have to have in your, um, in your discussion. And usually you write at the very beginning of the discussion um, what is uh, the main relation between what you have obtained and what you uh, wanted to investigate. Then very, very often, the discussion, uh, not always, but this is also almost uh, a mandatory part of a discussion, uh, is to have a, a, how, how your result uh, integrate uh, with previous studies, right? So actually, often a very big part of the discussion is uh, in relating your results to previous uh, studies. For example, if you develop an algorithm, you will discuss how that algorithm performs with respect to previous uh, Algorithms, uh, if you have done a physiological investigation, you would discuss how your results fit or do not fit with previous studies within the same uh, line of, uh, uh, of investigation. Um, another part of the discussion, uh, and this is not always present, uh, it depends, uh, but if you have a result that you did not expect uh, or observations that uh, you didn't foresee, then certainly is a good habit to discuss them in the discussion. Mm. This can be results that are uh, going uh, uh, against your hypothesis or partly against your hypothesis, but it can also be new results that are actually corroborating your hypothesis, but that you didn't expect to obtain from your, uh, from your studies. In the discussion, remember that uh, you may have in the results 
trends that are not statistically significant. So this means that um, when you talk about statistical trends, that you are quite close to statistical significance, but not uh, uh, not exactly there. Huh? So you have a p-value that's slightly above the threshold that you have uh, posed for statistical significance. This can still be di discussed. Huh? They can be included in the discussion, but very carefully. Huh? And certainly they cannot be made part uh, of the main take home messages and conclusions. Hmm? So uh, be sure to distinguish very well between trends uh, and results that are statistically uh, significant. Another um, comment that uh, is useful to, to report in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation is uh, because uh, it may save uh, time in the, in, the, in the many revisions of the drafts of a paper is to avoid redundancy between results and discussion. Discussion is not a place where you repeat your results. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, summarize your results briefly, but for example, um, don't uh, repeat uh, the exact numerical result that you have uh, in the result session. Mm -hmm. So here you have an example. We found that um, um, ANN and, uh, and SVM resulted in similar classification errors, that were not significantly different. Uh, and then here in parentheses, you had 23% uh, to 31% for ANN, 23 to 30% for SVM. This completely redundant. So the parentheses there is not needed in the discussion. You have uh, the detailed results in your result session. Do not repeat them in the discussion. Mm -hmm. All right, at the end of the discussion, uh, normally you end it uh, with uh, the main take-home messages. Uh, be sure that your paper has always take-home messages. Be sure that the readers uh, have clear in mind what are the main things that you want uh, that you want to deliver with your paper. All right, then the, the last of the main sessions uh, that I suggest you to write is the abstract. The abstract comes last for an obvious reason, because the abstract is a a summary of the entire work. So don't uh, waste time uh, to write the asset at the very beginning. Huh? Uh, it's useless because um, when you have finished to write all the other sessions, it's the best time uh, to summarize them. You can even use sentences uh, taken from the other sessions to write the abstract. Hmm? So wait the end before writing the abstract. What is the abstract? The abstract is one uh, paragraph normally. Normally it's between uh, 150 to 300 words. And uh, uh, it's a condensation, it's a summary of what you've done in your article. So of all the session of your paper. Mm -hmm. So it is fully self-contained. It should be fully understood uh, without, uh, uh, without reading the full paper. Uh, and uh, normally it contains uh, uh, the same uh, uh, subparts uh, as your paper. So it has uh, the purpose of the study, which is the central question that basically is the introduction. Very briefly, what, you, what was done, that is the methodology, a summary of the main results, which is the results, and finally, it has a conclusion statement, which is the discussion part. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's simply a summary of what you've done. Uh, obviously, make this uh, as the very last uh, task of your first draft uh, writing. Mm -hmm. Again, before checking, uh, before writing the abstract, once again, check the journal guidelines because some journals uh, may require a specific uh, structure in the in the abstract. For example, some journals require that uh, each subsession is specifically indicated mm, as methods, results, discussion, and so. On. All right. Once you have written an abstract, you have done um, ninety percent or ninety-five percent of your work uh, for the first draft. What you need to do is to make a list of acknowledgement, uh, of course, to complete the references. You may have appendices. Appendices may be, for example, part of the results that are not uh, uh, that important as to put in the main result session. They can be details on the methodology and so on. And, uh, and then uh, when you have finished the, the first draft, uh, you may have uh, uh, a colleague, a friend, uh, uh, maybe not even involved in the in the study, just to especially check the methodology session at this point, meaning that you're sure that you have written everything that is needed to be able to repeat what you have uh, what you have done. Mm -hmm. 
So that was the end of the first draft. That was normally what uh, the first author, the person who has done uh, the great majority also of the experimental work uh, or the or the technical work, complete. Mm? What happens after? Mm? Well, uh, uh, in uh, uh, for further draft, uh, you have uh, an iteration. You have an iteration in which you continue to check, of course, the grammar and the spelling. You check the readability. Mm? But of course, uh, the further drafts are characterized mainly by the iteration to all the co-authors. Mm, and, and maybe also other colleagues, right? Not necessarily only uh, only quarters. And of course, you have always the logic checks. So you iterate this, and you normally have uh, in your first paper uh, um, at least uh, I would say four to five iterations normally in the first paper among the quarters, uh, especially with your supervisor, to arrive uh, at a draft that is uh, almost uh, almost uh, final. Mm. Let's say that you've done all these iterations, so you've done all the iterations, the authors are happy, then you do the very final check before uh, you can submit uh, your, um, your paper, which is still a manuscript at this point. Uh, paper will be a paper when it's accepted for publication. Mm -hmm. So the final check that you do um, as a first author, just check at all the typos. Mm -hmm. Check the acronyms. Uh, check that all the acronyms uh, are defined the very first time you, def you, you use them and then are used consistently mm, throughout the entire, uh, the entire manuscript. So often the supervisors check for, for acronyms, but sometimes uh, the, the co-authors uh, consider it as um, obvious. Uh, and so you may need to recheck and be sure that the acronyms are properly used. Check once again for the layout, check that the appearance of the paper, the formatting uh, is uh, up to the best standard. Check again all the illustrations, uh, check the font size, uh, put the illustration in the right places. Uh, and once again, I think I said it uh, a few times now, recheck uh, again the publisher instruction for authors. That's just to be sure that you have not uh, missed anything. Uh, the one thing you, you don't want to have uh, is the situation in which you submit your paper to the publisher and you get it back after 24 hours saying, look, you have not formatted this correctly or you have done that not appropriately. Confirm the acknowledgements. If you acknowledge people, normally is a good habit to inform the people that you acknowledge. And uh, normally it is a good habit to have their approval because they may, they may not want to be acknowledged. You don't know. And then make a final check uh, you know, to all the references, uh, reference style, but also the way in which references are, uh, are uh, cited in the paper. All right, now you are, you're ready. You are ready to, we have towards the end also of, um, uh, of um, our talk. You are ready to submit uh, your paper. Mm? As I said, uh, uh, technically still call a manuscript uh, until it is published. Uh, and when it's published, it's called paper. But anyway, you are ready to submit it. And uh, normally you have two main categories uh, if we talk about scientific papers. One is conference proceedings. Uh, conference proceedings normally are shorter than journal papers, um, normally have uh, uh, less impact than journal papers, lower rejection rates. And normally you send um, uh, your manuscript to conferences when you have uh, preliminary results. Take into account there are exceptions. Eh? So there are, for example, conferences uh, in some fields, such as computer science, that are uh, of uh, extremely high level with extremely high rejection rates. Mm? So also, um, these are not uh, rules that are valid for every single uh, for every single case. There are always exceptions. And then there are journals. Uh, uh, journals are normally, uh, in the majority of the cases, uh, the, the the best target where you have your complete research uh, that you would like to publish, uh, they have a uh, bigger impact than conferences normally, and they stay there forever, right? We are still reading uh, journal papers of um, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, right? Uh, so they have um, a very long lasting, uh, long lasting uh, uh, impact. Mm? Um, now, often, uh, especially if you are um, uh, doing your PhD, often uh, uh, a good strategy or reasonable strategy would be to first prepare uh, a, a smaller version of your study 
or a preliminary version of your study to submit to a conference, and then and then you submit the full study to a uh, to a journal, uh, which is uh, which is uh, a perfectly reasonable uh, reasonable approach. Mm -hmm. Now, lately, this is something that um, has been particularly uh, popular in scientific publications in the last uh, maybe five to ten years, uh, maybe less. Uh, is the is the preprint uh, is to to publish uh, your full uh, journal um, uh, manuscript uh, as a preprint uh, in a server so that is uh, publicly available. Mm -hmm. So this implies, uh, just to be clear, that uh, for example. Uh, you have your full uh, uh, journal uh, paper draft, uh, you submit it to a journal, at the same time you also put it uh, on the web in a specific uh, preprint server, and this is publicly available to everybody. So before your journal is published, your paper is published in a journal, it is actually fully available to, uh, to anyone. Mm -hmm. So this is a good habit to, to, to publish uh, preprints. Uh, there are now, uh, I mean, most of the research groups do that for all uh, or the majority of their uh, papers uh, because there are a lot of uh, advantages. Well, first, uh, you can share your latest research advances uh, to the scientific community very, very quickly. And you don't have to wait um, all the uh, peer review process uh, uh, that the journal does. And you can also receive a feedback. So you can receive a feedback from the scientific community on your preprint, and you can integrate this feedback before the paper is uh, published in the journal. So that's, uh, that's positive. Uh, another positive aspect of preprints is that they are open access to everybody. And so this uh, help and support the, freely, um, the free access for everyone to research. And also, especially for the individuals, uh, uh, for yourself, uh, uh, publish a preprint uh, is very important uh, for um, uh, the impact of your research because the preprint can be fully cited. It has normally a digital object identifier, and so it counts uh, as a publication to cite uh, as any other. And so it uh, increases the visibility of your research. And also, if you're interested in these things, your citation count. Um, these are some of the most popular preprint servers, um, archives by archives and so on. These are all uh, very uh, serious servers. They do a, a technical check and not a scientific check, a technical check of your, uh, of your uh, submission within normally 24, 48 hours. And then they publish it uh, where it is uh, freely available to, uh, to everybody. Uh, when you submit a preprint, uh, also consider, though, a few aspects that, uh, that are um, somehow important to, to be aware of. Mm. The first is that you are submitting and showing to everybody something that is not peer-reviewed. Mm. So sometimes uh, when we send the papers for peer review <coughs> to a journal, we receive comments that are very important for the quality of the paper. Sometimes the paper uh, is increased in, in quality, actually, in the majority of the times, that's the the, the aim of peer review, the quality substantially increases because of the peer review process. So when you send a preprint, uh, you have uh, everybody looking uh, at your basically rough, rough research, which has been uh, commented and prepared only within your research group. Mm -hmm. So you may be happy to do that, but sometimes uh, maybe you, you want to wait for the peer review in order to be sure that you are giving uh, the information in the best possible quality. For the same reason, you, you also have the risk to, to provide the misinformation. For example, the reviewers may find that some of your results uh, are not uh, fully correct. Then you may change your analysis, but if you have posted a preprint, that information has been uh, delivered. And maybe people can use that information, which is, uh, which is incorrect. From the more practical side, uh, also remember that you, again, check the instruction for authors and be sure that the journal where you submit your paper accept that you publish a preprint. Now, the great majority of the journals accept preprint, so this is a limited issue, but be sure before sending the preprint that where you have published, where you have submitted your paper, the, the, the publisher accept this uh, uh, this uh, uh, preprint submission. Mm -hmm. Certainly, don't use the preprint as a means uh, 
to rush as much as possible uh, in showing that you've done uh, a great study. So don't rush to publish a preprint. My suggestion would be to publish a preprint not before you have uh, submitted uh, the paper to a scientific journal, meaning that not before you have the very final draft. Mm -hmm. Uh, because at least in that case, uh, you are sure that within your research group, uh, you are fully happy about the quality of that uh, information that you are making public available to everybody. All right, so uh, now you are at the point where you have to submit it to a journal. How do you select a journal? And I may go a bit faster now because I think I am um, using a bit too much time. So how do you select a journal? Well, uh, a journal is to have... Uh, to be selected in order that your work uh, certainly has an impact in your field. Mm -hmm. So normally you select a journal for the reputation and, um, uh, and for the possible influence that it can have uh, on a specific, uh, a specific field. The golden rule, in my opinion, is to maximize uh, that uh, others, the probability that others will see your work first, will read your work second, and will use your result third. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important thing. Uh, the more uh, are the readers of your work, the more your work will have impact and will be used. Mm -hmm. So that's the golden uh, rule. How do you do that when you select a journal and you want to maximize what we just said? Well, you can base your selection certainly on the quality of the scientific journal, of the impact of the scientific journal, on the level of the readership, uh, on the readership itself, on the potential for uh, uh, for citations, all these are um, are correct. But how do you do actually do? Uh, how do we actually meet these uh, requirements? Well, there are some uh, some ways to do that. For a journal, as you know, you have the impact factor. The impact factor is heavily criticized by some, or is considered as uh, the most important things by others. But certainly, the impact factor. There is no doubt that is a good reference for uh, for a journal. Mm -hmm. A good impact factor implies uh, normally a good journal. Reputation in the field, especially if you are new in writing uh, papers, maybe consult, not maybe, for sure consult with your supervisor and co-authors, and they will certainly have very good ideas uh, in what is uh, a reputable journal in the field. Mm -hmm. Everybody who has uh, a good um, experience in the field, so every senior author in your, in your paper would know what is um, a journal that has a good reputation or a bad reputation within that uh, within that area? And you can have other markers of, um, of of quality of various styles depending on uh, on the area. One thing that is important, but your supervisors will always tell you, when you select a journal, uh, be always ambitious, uh, but uh, also realistic, right? So be as ambitious as possible, but also don't. Uh, over exaggerate in your, uh, in your ambition. Um, also take into account uh, when you submit uh, to, to a journal uh, the, the DORA principles. The DORA principles are not principles for submission, they are principles for assessing research, actually. So to, to, to quantify and, uh, the quality of the research. But they are important uh, when you decide where to submit uh, to have this in mind because uh, these are uh, good principles for external people to judge research. And if you have those in mind, then you have uh, a good idea of uh, where to submit and, and what to submit. Mm -hmm. So DORA principle, very briefly summarized, uh, says that uh, you, should quality, you should focus on quality rather than quantity. So better to have uh, a few very good uh, papers than many uh, average papers, that's, uh, uh, that's obvious. There is more and more uh, an, a, an ascent, um, a encouragement for open access. So, uh, and very soon open access will be universally, universally used. So uh, open access papers uh, are normally read more than non-open access papers. Uh, open access implies accessibility to research for everybody, which is, um, which is positive. Mm -hmm. Uh, one aspect of the DORA uh, principle for assessment of research, which is, uh, which is important to take into account, uh, is uh, what is written uh, here in the middle of the slide. Always evaluate the research uh, based on its own merit, uh, not only on the reputation of the journal or on the author reputation. Mm -hmm. So every paper uh, has uh, its own merit. Uh, 
depending on what uh, on what it contains. Mm. And then uh, in the DORA principles, uh, uh, everybody who has uh, collaborated uh, in a paper, of course, has to be recognized. Um, this also means that you have to choose your authors list in the proper in the proper way. One note, uh, there are more and more. This is again uh, something that uh, is becoming uh, an issue only in the past five years, probably so something recent. Uh, uh, as you know, there are more and more journals coming out of the blue, uh, and many of them are not legitimate journals. They are what um, are often called predatory journals uh, that basically are the city journals. They exploit research for profit. They ask you money to publish your papers. Uh, many journals ask you money, and they are legitimate, but uh, some uh, are pushing only uh, for that uh, without uh, considering uh, the scientific quality. Mm. So they mimic uh, uh, journals that are rigorous in peer review, but they are uh, not. The red flags, uh, when you are guaranteed a very rapid publication, uh, um, often for a fee, when you see websites or poor grammar, when you receive emails that are uh, written uh, in, uh, in, in a strange way, not, uh, not very professionally, uh, or when there is a very aggressive solicitation of papers, for example, uh, we are publishing um, our latest issue. We need uh, only one more paper, and we will be we will be honored if it is your paper. And so on. all these uh, are clear red flags uh, on journals that are not legitimate journals. They are just uh, they are just um, coming in and out, uh, disappearing in uh, in a matter of months, sometimes uh, just looking for money um, to to publish your um, your work. Why to avoid them is quite obvious. It's obvious that they damage the research credibility and they mislead the scientific community and there is no reason to publish in these journals. Your work will have no value as pu when publishing these journals. Mm. So always use uh, trusted resources to find legitimate journals, uh, check for the editorial board credentials, but of course, if you are very junior in the field, uh, always consult with your supervisor or uh, senior co-authors. Briefly, what you have finally submitted, uh, let's say that you have chosen your journals after uh, after uh, uh, all these efforts, <laughs> you have submitted the, what happens after you submit, uh, normally a senior editor examines your manuscript uh, and uh, more and more uh, journals now are having a buyer at this point, an editor can decide to send it uh, to external peer review or not. Uh, and uh, when it is not submitted, sent to peer review, it is sent back to the author, says uh, rejected. And that happens maybe when uh, the paper does not meet the limit of the journal uh, or uh, it is not uh, of uh, broad enough interest for the readership of that journal. Mm -hmm. But if the review process starts, so if the senior editor send it uh, for uh, review, then you have normally uh, two to three reviewers, normally two. But in some cases, you can have many more. That depends on the journals, on the areas of, re of, uh, of research and so on. And uh, the reviewers uh, are your peers, uh, are um, scientists uh, as you, that remains anonymous to you and that uh, judge uh, your paper and write a report uh, on your paper. Based on the report, which are returned to the editor within a few months. Normally, the editor decides uh, if, the journal, if the paper can be accepted, accepted with major or major revision, or uh, rejected. And then uh, you enter in a loop, so in which uh, if uh, your paper is uh, potentially acceptable, you, ask, you are asked for revisions so that the reviewers will check, and there can be multiple revision uh, loops. Normally, there is one or two iterations, no more than that, but it may also be that there are more, more than that. Mm. And uh, finally, at the end of this, uh, of this uh, loop, uh, your paper is hopefully accepted and uh, published. Uh, from the time you submit a paper to a journal to the time it's published, uh, normally, I would say, again, from my empirical experience, uh, you have around six months. And this is the reason why, as we discussed before, sometimes you would like to have a preprint that tells people that you have done that study before you have the final paper accepted and published. So to conclude, uh, we've been uh, almost one hour talking about uh, scientific communication and scientific papers. 
So writing scientific papers is uh, a part of scientific communication and is uh, certainly the highest level of scientific communication, where you write science at the highest level. It requires attention to your readership. You have to be able to deliver your messages. These are three key words. Uh, every time you write a sentence, uh, keep in mind these words, uh, conciseness, clarity, and accuracy. Mm? That's, uh, if, if you have to remember something from this uh, talk, remember these three, these three key words. We have looked at the structure, introduction, method, results, and discussion. We have looked uh, at uh, rules for best communication in these, these sessions. We have looked at how to write the first draft and completing all the parts of the structure. I have suggested you an order that I think is the most appropriate, but it's not the only one. And uh, we have discussed uh, that uh, at the end, uh, all details in a paper have to be uh, in a way that the final product is almost a perfect product. Mm? This is achieved by a number of iterations of that first draft until all co-authors and all colleagues are satisfied, don't rush into iterations, uh, be patient. Sometimes your supervisor will ask you to iterate it uh, 10 times, 20 times. That is only uh, because uh, the final product uh, has to be the finest possible uh, one. And then we have finished uh, by talking about uh, the uh, selection of the paper publisher and some of the issues related to that. With this, uh, I thank you very much uh, for the attention. I believe there is uh, a bit of time for uh, uh, questions. And uh, Alejandro, I think you, yes, so you are uh, managing the questions. Yes, so we have uh, a question for one from one of the, the users that is asking what is the best way to manage the conflicts related to early research publications versus potential inter intellectual property opportunities? So what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, this is a very good, uh, a very good question. And uh, uh, we uh, ourselves in our research group, uh, we always have that problem uh, of uh, especially in engineering research, where there is uh, something that can be protected uh, in terms of intellectual property. And at the same time, um, um, it has to be published at some point, and you would like to have it published soon. It's very difficult to solve that, uh, that issue. Of course, if there is uh, an IP that uh, you want to protect and is particularly important, you are obliged to wait for the publication. So you cannot do otherwise. So unfortunately, the scientific publication aspect uh, becomes of um, a second priority. This is a big issue, in my opinion, because sometimes um, scientific publication can be delayed of several months, sometimes years. And we have examples in our own group because of that issue. And so my only, uh, my only uh, advice is to be as quick as possible if you are sure that there is IP to be protected as quick as possible in filing uh, the first draft of the patent as soon as you have filed the very first uh, uh, draft of the patent uh, you are allowed uh, to to publish and then you can use the preprint uh, aspects in order the, to not delay further and so this is sort of a compromise to have your ip protected and as soon as possible to have your science uh, uh, publicly available to the scientific community Thank you, Dario. So we have we don't have more questions in the chat, um, but I'm pretty sure I could ask you a few more. But I don't want to steal more time for for Juan's presentation. So, sure. thank uh, you very thank, much. Thank you very much for for your time for your presentation. And now we'll leave the floor to Juan Perez. He's an European Project Coordinator uh, Manager at uh, CTPC in Barcelona, and he will give the talk about uh, European Project uh, proposals. So, Juan, the floor is yours. Uh, Thank you, Alejandro. You hear me well, right? Yes, we can hear you. All yours. Very good. Uh, thanks, Dario, for your uh, presentation. I think it was very uh, useful. I know nothing about papers, so now I feel like uh, <laughs> I can almost uh, write one this uh, very same afternoon. Eh? So thanks for that. Uh, tough topic, eh? uh, uh, paper writing, uh, if I can think of a tougher <laughs> topic, uh, even more complex is probably that of uh, European projects, so that's my uh, session, so sorry for that. Um, Okay, if you're wondering if this webinar is for you, uh, well, if you feel uh, more or less like this every time you hear 
about European projects? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, if you are more or less familiar with European projects, um, this still might be interesting uh, to you. I'll try to share some uh, tips uh, about European projects that I have learned uh, over the last uh, 20 plus uh, years. Okay. So this is me, I'm an industrial uh, engineer. Uh, I'm European project uh, manager at CIT UPC, which is the technical uh, center of, uh, of the University of uh, Technical University of uh, Catalonia. I've created um, many uh, European projects uh, over the last uh, 20 years in many different areas, such as health, uh, mobility, digital, environment, and so on. I'm independent evaluator for EU programs, uh, also funding advisor for deep uh, tech uh, startups. And finally, uh, I'm also an investor in uh, a few uh, early stage uh, startups, mainly in the fields of health and mobility. Okay, so uh, this is the agenda for today. I'll try to keep it uh, to 40, 45 minutes maximum to allow for, for a few questions if you, if you have them. Um, so, uh, first part is the brief introduction to Horizon Europe, to the types of projects, to all the uh, content. Uh, that's the toughest uh, part, but we need to go through it. Uh, then the second is uh, a few tips about defining suitable uh, project concepts. Uh, I will share with you an example of a successful uh, project uh, from the past. Um, then a few tips about building the consortium, also planning the proposal development. Um, estimating roles and budget, uh, one of my favorite sections, writing a winning proposal, and then uh, we'll finish with the evaluation uh, process, okay? So um, Horizon Europe, uh, it's, uh, as you probably know, uh, one of the biggest, uh, the biggest, in fact, uh, European program in terms of R&D. It spans from uh, 2021 to 2027. And it's uh, built uh, around uh, three uh, pillars. Um, so, you oh, yeah. um, it's built around uh, three pillars. Uh, so, number one, it's called excellent uh, science. Um, here's where we have the ERC, which is kind of like the Oscar for for the scientists. Then you have uh, you probably heard also about these Marie Curie actions for. Uh, researchers, exchange, uh, and so on. And then there's a sub-program on research, specific research uh, infrastructures. Uh, then pillar two is um, built around uh, what we call uh, challenges. There, there are six main clusters, uh, which are, you can see them here, uh, health, uh, culture, and creativity, civil uh, security uh, for society, digital industry, climate and energy mobility, and food and agri. Um, these are the most typical European collaborative projects where there's a uh, different, uh, where you put together a consortium of different kinds of uh, partners. And most of uh, what I'm going to be talking about today uh, is going to be around uh, this pillar too, but uh, it's also applicable on most of it also to the other uh, two pillars. And then we have a pillar number three, Innovative, innovative uh, Europe, uh, which um, has to do more with innovation, with uh, higher TRLs. Uh, also, the involvement of companies is a bit more relevant uh, or decisive, uh, I would say here. Um, so here you have, uh, for example, the program, the EAC Accelerator, for uh, funding the growth of uh, deep tech startups. Uh, you have also the EATs that you might know, the kicks and so on. And then there's a fourth and not so important uh, widening participation uh, block, okay? Just to let you know about the... Um, wait, no. no. Uh, to let you know about the um, funding, um, there's uh, this is the breakdown. Uh, so you see there's like a fourth of the overall budget for uh, excellent science. You have more than half for the challenges and then the other fourth for the other two. And the clusters, the ones that have most uh, budget are cluster four and five, digital industry and climate energy mobility, but also uh, there are some very important ones like health uh, and food. Okay. Um, 
So what the European Commission, uh, what they do is for every uh, of these clusters, they define like uh, big areas where they want to fund uh, projects. So you can see I, I copied here the ones for cluster one, so for the health uh, cluster, just so that you have an idea of what kind of things they are uh, funding. OK, so uh, area number one is staying healthy in a rapidly changing society. And you have here topics uh, such as uh, diet and health, aging, mental health, all these kind of things. Then area number two is living and working in a health promoting environment. Um, number three, tackling diseases and reducing disease burden. Um, here you can, uh, they include better diagnostics, personalized uh, treatments, uh, new advanced therapies. Number four is ensuring access to innovative, uh, sustainable, high quality healthcare. Number five, unlocking the full potential of new tools, technologies, and digital solutions. And number six, uh, maintaining innovative, uh, sustainable, and globally competitive uh, health industry. Okay, just so that you have an idea of which are the main trends that they are uh, covering in, with the Horizon Europe. Um, but uh, yeah, like uh, all good things in life, funding opportunities, they come in different sizes, colors, flavors. Uh, there, there's many different programs and sub programs and topics. Uh, it's very complex to um, to keep up to date with all the different uh, programs, even for the people that uh, work on this professionally uh, the whole time. Uh, but I'll try to navigate you through the most uh, important uh, ones. So. The typical collaborative uh, European project is um, uh, must fit with uh, uh, what they call what the European Commission calls uh, topic. Topic is a piece of paper uh, and typically around one page uh, where the European Commission uh, specifies very clearly uh, what kind of uh, research they are looking for. Okay, I will I will show you an example in the next uh, slide. Typical duration of these projects are between three, four years. Sometimes they can uh, be extended to five years. Um, typical budgets are between six, eight million euros, but they can be bigger. Consortium uh, around six, eight, 10 partners, sometimes uh, bigger. I worked uh, a long time ago in a project with 40 uh, partners, for example. Okay, and this is a topic. Uh, you can see here uh, more or less the structure. So there's a title, uh, Self-Management of Health and Disease, Mobile Health. Uh, what the European Commission does is uh, they write an introductory uh, paragraph uh, just to set the scene uh, about, uh, okay, what are we talking about? Then they um, have a second section, what they call scope, uh, that tries to more or less put the boundaries to the, to the types of projects that they are willing to receive. For example, we are talking about mobile health. Here they tell you, okay, proposals uh, should feature the following characteristics. Strong emphasis on co-designing uh, together with the users. Uh, knowledge management systems uh, to analyze and compile uh, information from patients. Guidance for patients, caregivers, families is important. Patient adherence is also important. Economic aspects are also important for this uh, topic, okay? Normally, they also give you like um, a window of uh, budget that they think would be nice for uh, proposers. Eh? So uh, if you propose, uh, you make a proposal, normally it comes with, uh, with a budget uh, to be able, able to implement it. Um, and you can choose a little bit in, in this, uh, uh, between these two limits here, in this case, between three and five million euros. And then finally, they give you an expected uh, impact. Um, that means the kind of impacts that they are expecting from the project once uh, it's finished. Right? Once you, you get the grant and you implement the project, uh, okay, and they should, for example, this project should improve the self-management of health, uh, should uh, strengthen evidence uh, based on health outcomes, quality of life, uh, blah, 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 increase confidence in decision support systems, improve um, improve interaction between patients, relatives, caregivers, etc. Okay, this is uh, important because I wanted to show you how a, a topic uh, looks like. And then we will see uh, later uh, one successful project that responded to this very, very specific uh, topic. Okay, 
Um, I don't know if you uh, are um, familiar with uh, this uh, topic, uh, technology revenues levels, but as we will use it uh, later, I'd like to introduce it. Uh, basically, it's a, a kind of classification is copied uh, or well, borrowed, uh, let's say, from NASA. Uh, they developed it, and basically, it's a way to uh, categorize categorize the uh, the technology according to uh, where it is in terms of uh, is it very incipient? Is, is it just like, for example, in the idea phase that corresponds to uh, phases three or three? Uh, is it in the prototype phase? Uh, then it would be TRL four or five. You already have a system consisting of several integrated uh, prototypes. Uh, then you are in the validation uh, phase, and then you are in a TRL six seven. And uh, when you approach uh, nine, nine is basically uh, already a product or a service uh, or a technology already in the market. Okay, this is important because we will use it later. So these are the most relevant type of actions uh, that uh, that you can use to uh, to create proposals or to ask for uh, funding from the European Commission. Um, this is also a part of the topic. Uh, typically, they tell you if uh, it should be a RIA, a research and innovation action, or an EA, innovation action. I will explain these two uh, in the next uh, slides. The third one is not so relevant uh, for the moment. I'll I'll just skip it. One, just one second. I yeah. have a, a question. Like, how yeah. do we know if uh, that we are fitting uh, the topic that has been uh, published? Because uh, sometimes they can be quite broad, and you yeah. don't really know if you'll have your chances or not. So that's a very good uh, question. Uh, um, uh, the first thing I, I, I can respond is uh, you have to make sure that you fit perfectly. That That's like the, the, the hygiene factor. It has to uh, fit perfectly. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to make it huh? because uh, I've uh, met uh, during uh, my career many researchers or, or uh, professionals that say, hey, yeah, it more or less fits with this bullet and that other. And they try to be very uh, optimistic in a way. Yeah, more or less, if we wear it somehow, the proposal, we can make it fit. And the answer is no, it has to be uh, has to fit perfectly with each and every line uh, defined in the topic. So first uh, recommendation is you have to be very critical and, and probably uh, um, if you are less experienced and I understand that the audience today uh, is mainly a form of uh, young researchers, um, go and talk with your more experienced researchers that probably have a, a, a better, uh, let's say, nose. Huh? They, they are already a bit more experienced and know uh, uh, how to interpret some of these uh, these topics and know or they can be a bit more strict in saying, hey, OK, what you're proposing is very good, but it does not fit this topic. You you should uh, search uh, for for another one. So my recommendation is to to be very strict, to ask for uh, help uh, from people that knows more than you, if you're not very, very familiar with uh, with a proposal building. And this might be either people in your organization or uh, people that uh, are uh, professionally uh, uh, doing that. That could be like consultants, if you have some budget to work with consultants, or it can be national contact points. We do have in Spain national contact points. You do have in the UK the same. All European countries have their own uh, uh, NCPs, national contact points, and they can help you in this process of, of making sure that your ideas fit with the, with the call text. Uh, and then one final comment. Um, in the past, um, it used to be that the topics were very specific. They they told you, hey, we want the proposers to do this, to work on this very specific technology to, to try to uh, cure that specific disease. Now they're very broad. You can see here the example. They're talking about mobile health. And that was it. Huh? <laughs> so you can present anything that uh, fits uh, on this. So, you always have to uh, uh, move between these two um, areas. Uh, you have to make sure that you fit very, very well, but at the same time, the topic is very open. <laughs> so there's room for many uh, types of uh, projects. And yeah, it's only the experience that tells you if you're doing it uh, well or not. Okay, I hope I answered. Uh, Thank you, yes. Um, okay.
So RIAs, uh, the first one, um, RIAs, uh, they are uh, basically uh, projects that aim to establish new knowledge, to explore the feasibility of new or improved technologies, products, processes, uh, et cetera. Uh, the components of, uh, of these RIAs are typically, are typically research, t uh, technology development, integration, testing, validation, and typically in a small scale uh, prototype or, or simulated environment. Uh, the TRLs, uh, we uh, introduced them before. Normally, you will start with technologies that are a TRL 3, 4, and by the end of the project, you have increased them to a TRL 6, okay? This is more or less an, an average, but it's important to keep this in, in mind. Uh, the minimum requirement for the consortium is three partners from three different countries, but this is a very, very minimum. Uh, typically, as I said before, um, you would be working with eight, 10 different uh, partners. And co-funding of 100%. And that means that all the budgets from all the partners in the consortium uh, will be covered 100% by the European Commission if you are successful. Okay. Then innovative actions. Uh, they're very similar, but you uh, see that uh, they uh, skip, they took the R, the research uh, R uh, from GRIAS. So basically, these are uh, planning, designing new or improved products, uh, processes, or uh, services. And here, the type of things of modules that uh, you can incorporate into, into your project are prototyping, testing, demos, piloting, uh, product validation. You see that all these kind of word and keywords uh, sound a bit more uh, to TRL, TRLs that are higher and to things that are a little bit higher, uh, higher TRL are closer to the market. Okay, more or less the, the research uh, has been done, and here's about testing and, and demonstrating in some kind of close to market environment. Okay, uh, although uh, the projects may include limited R&D activities if it's uh, necessary. And here the TRL scale moves a little bit to the right, let's say. So uh, you start with uh, TRLs between five, six, and you typically end uh, uh, with TRLs seven and sometimes eight. And uh, the difference with uh, RIAs in the co-funding is that for non-profit organizations, so academics uh, in general, uh, public institutions, universities, uh, technology centers, it's still 100%, but for companies, it's only 70% uh, uh, co-funding. Okay, uh, we move into uh, the next uh, section, um, defining a, a suitable project concept. And I wanted to start with the possible role that a partner that you uh, can have uh, in uh, putting together a, a European proposal or, or when participating in a European proposal. You can be the coordinator if you're a young researcher, maybe that's a bit uh, too uh, ambitious. Uh, but uh, if you already have some experience, you could be a core group member, uh, which are typically the work package leaders, and they have a little bit more weight uh, in the in the project and in the decision making. Or otherwise, you can start as a, a partner, a regular partner. Um, just to let you know that uh, typically the more uh, you go up, uh, uh, and the, if you're a coordinator, or core group uh, member the more decision-making power you will have, but also the more resources you will involve in the, in the proposal elaboration, okay? And then there's a, another possible role, which is the initiator, uh, which does not always need to correspond to the coordinator, right? You can initiate uh, um, a project with, um, a project concept uh, with gathering a three, four core group partners that are uh, close to you and that you think fit very well with the with the project idea. And then from there, take it and, and ask uh, any of them if they would be willing to coordinate or maybe together go and try and find a, a coordinator, okay? Um, yeah, this is what I call the, the seven gatekeepers eh, for the creation of a Horizon Europe uh, proposal. Um, First uh, is, uh, is there a suitable uh, call with acceptable uh, timing? Uh, in these topics that I showed you before, there's always a deadline uh, associated to each of them. Um, we'll see it later, but uh, in this kind of uh, projects, uh, you typically, if you want to do it well, it'll take you between four or five, six months to prepare a good proposal. Um, so that's why this first question is relevant. Is there a suitable call with acceptable uh, timings? And, 
one month is not acceptable. And I, I still at my university, I receive uh, requests from, from professors to, to build a project in a month or a month and a half. And I say, hey, no, uh, that's not possible anymore. Maybe 20 years ago, uh, but not now. The competence is, uh, is so big. The quality of the proposals is so big that it doesn't make any sense trying to build something like this with uh, uh, within such a short uh, time frame. Okay, uh, does your project idea fit into the call very well? So the, the question uh, Alejandro was putting in before, do we have the necessary time and energy eh, needed to build a top proposal? Uh, are there you partners that can uh, want to cooperate with us? Can we wait around one year to the project kickoff? Eh? You take the time that uh, you consider the time for proposal building and then the time for evaluation and then the time for negotiations for the with the European Commission. It'll be a year from the uh, from day one uh, to the to the kickoff uh, meeting. Can you wait uh, one year uh, for for this? This is maybe a more relevant question for companies more than academics, eh? because um, academics can still get funding for their own research through other means or can wait. And typically, they do not have such a strict uh, uh, pressure, let's say, for to develop new technologies or, or products, but mm, industry does. So uh, can they wait uh, one year to create a kickoff? Can they accept? Can we accept uh, partially sharing the results uh, generated? And then finally, do we envisage an ambitious and high quality project that can compete at EU level? If we can't, let's bet, let's, uh, it's bet best not to get uh, started. Okay. This is a, a very general overview of the um, process for proposal preparation. You have your idea, you find an opportunity, uh, which is the topic. Based on this, and when you have your idea, you, you find your partners, your core group partners, uh, you register, write your proposal, submit it, and then there's the evaluation. But I like to see this process more like this. Um, this is, um, let's say, the way a, um, a winning proposal should be created. And it goes along three axes. Uh, there's one for the consortium uh, that you can see here in the upper side. There's one for content and there's one for funding. Uh, in the first phase, uh, you, you uh, put together the core group, uh, the, the key people that can be R&D partners, end users, SMEs, or whoever, uh, that are really, really core to the project, uh, and, and without uh, which you could not implement or you could not win this uh, proposal. Together with them, you, you basically sketch uh, some initial project uh, definition with the scope, with very clear objectives. And, and then together with this, uh, you also define very uh, global uh, funding uh, scheme uh, for the project. Then you make the extra partner search uh, and you add specific technical roles. You involve a specific industrial partners if they are needed, maybe some business experts and so on. Um, and with the content uh, of the proposal, you also take it a step farther. Uh, so you start defining tasks with all these partners already, roles, uh, the planning, the deliverables, and also the budgets uh, together with them. And then the latest uh, part of the project, uh, you just balance the consortium eh, just for to make sure that you have all the necessary roles that you have uh, nationality some, sometimes, huh? because it's also interesting not to concentrate um, all the partners into, into a few uh, re European regions. Huh? Uh, and the same with the proposal, you complete it, uh, you make sure that it's very well balanced and very well written, and uh, you finally also do the same with the, with the funding. You get the detail, very detailed funding uh, that you need to provide um, to the European Commission. Okay, so uh, I'll uh, go very quickly through an example of a, a successful collaborative R&D project. And uh, this was funded some years ago already, but I think it's useful for those of you who do not know so much about European projects. Uh, the project was called uh, Woman Up. Uh, the title is Cost Effective Self-Management of Urinary Incontinence Addressed to Women Across Europe. And it was written in response to the topic that I showed you before about mobile health, I remember. Um, so 
bit of introduction, the objective uh, was to uh, improve the quality of life of uh, UI, urinary continence patients, uh, through a holistic and cost-effective ICT solution, allowing for the self-management of uh, UI via a decision support system and secure remote medical supervision. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, the uh, prevalence of UI is very high in, in women, uh, increasing when they get uh, like uh, older, uh, older, uh, older ages. Uh, but also, you see around the the years that they give um, birth uh, for the first time that there there's also a peak, uh, and the years after because uh, the the pel uh, pelvic floor uh, muscles they get distended. Huh? So uh, the available treatments, uh, the, the, let's say the golden treatment, at least in Spain and some other uh, European countries is uh, pelvic floor muscle training uh, uh, with feedback or uh, biofeedback. And that's basically uh, getting some kind of feedback from, from a person or from uh, taking some bio signals to uh, make sure that you are doing well your exercises. And this is... Uh, especially important uh, because uh, with the pelvic floor muscle training, uh, when you're trying to exercise the, the, this, this type of muscle, sometimes if you do not do it well, you are uh, putting the effort in your abs and not on the pelvic floor uh, area. And so that's why it's very, very important to have this kind of feedback to make sure that you are doing well the exercises. So uh, yeah, uh, typically it's a supervised uh, training. Um, yeah, any factor that may stimulate the adherence to the treatment should be uh, recommended. Uh, yeah, and a bio, a bio uh, feedback uh, solution should be uh, given as an option for home training, okay? So this is more or less how it works, uh, at least in Spain, uh, when you are diagnosed with this, you, you have to follow like a, a plan where you go to the doctor, uh, you insert uh, one of these probes into the vagina and you start uh, uh, pressing or exercising your muscles. Uh, the, the probe uh, gets the signal and it tells you more or less if you are doing it uh, well or, uh, or not. Uh, this is the most advanced ones in the past uh, or still it's being done. Uh, it's the, the nurse who puts uh, her fingers into the vagina of the woman uh, to really feel if uh, they're doing uh, uh, the exercise uh, well. And this is, the, as you can imagine, very, very intrusive, uh, very, uh, well, uh, uh, not appropriate uh, for, for some women. And uh, here's where our project uh, came uh, in. Uh, we developed a solution uh, of a remote uh, wearable device, so you can wear it uh, at home. Uh, you can insert it in, in, in your vagina, in the, in the commodity of your house. Uh, the idea is that um, it's connected to, uh, well, to a web platform where the physicians can see and uh, can follow, uh, can monitor the progress of the sessions that you are doing to, uh, to improve your, uh, your training, your exercise. And one very interesting thing that we did is uh, to also um, promote the, the adherence uh, to the treatment is this Kegel exercise, they're, they're called. Um, Basically, what they are is uh, you you have this probe uh, and then uh, the system says, uh, okay, uh, make force and then release, make force, release, following certain patterns. What we did is uh, to create a video game uh, when, uh, for example, you need to make force, uh, it's kind of Mario uh, game. Uh, so you make the force and Mario jumps and then you uh, have to release and then Mario goes back to the floor. So then you are kind of playing a video game, but at the same time exercising. Uh, and this is the concept of uh, adherence to the treatment, making things that uh, will make uh, the patients follow the, the desired uh, treatment. Okay, so we developed this just to let you know uh, um, what kind of partners we had. Um, we it was us, the, the Technical University of Catalonia, we're experts in EMG. We have been working together with the hospital uh, clinic in Barcelona on this topic, urinary incontinence, for uh, for a long time. Uh, and then in that project, uh, we wanted to have a multi-site uh, clinical trial to demonstrate that the that the performance of this remote. Uh, device uh, was not better, but the same as uh, as the on the side on the clinic uh, treatment, uh, but of course with a lot of 
uh, advantages. So uh, no need to uh, travel to the hospital, no need to, to having a nurse put her fingers into uh, into your vagina, uh, and no need to uh, escape uh, work because you can do it in the commodity of your um, home uh, anytime. So all these kind of things, uh, we wanted to prove with the clinical trial that um, we could have the same performance with all these uh, advantages. So these are three uh, hospitals because we did in Barcelona with patients in Barcelona, in uh, Netherlands and in Finland. Then we had a, a company uh, responsible for the exploitation of the results of the project. Uh, then we had a health psychology partner um, who was working uh, precisely on this topic on, on the adhe uh, adherence to the treatment. They, they were experts on this very uh, concrete topic. Then the people, this SME uh, who did the, the video games, uh, the serious games, uh, they call them. Uh, and then uh, the European Eurogynecological Association working mainly on dissemination and awareness raising uh, topics. Okay, I, I thought it was interesting to show you the the the, uh, the project itself, but also the partners and why, because each of them, as you can see, they have a very very specific role in the in the project. Okay, uh, this is a video, but I don't think we have time for this. Okay, so we jump into building the consortium. A few uh, tips on this. Uh, this we already saw. Core group, as I told you before, we normally start with the core group creation, right? These three, four partners that together uh, create the, the proposal. Uh, you, you have to identify a few of these players that are key to the project success. Huh? And we would really need them, their expertise, their role, their uh, what they can bring to the project to make it a success. Um, core group members have to be highly committed uh, to the to the project, and then uh, yeah, they typically have a substantially higher budgets and also more decision making power. Criteria for selecting these core group members: uh, organization background, motivation that they have, interest on the project results, experience that they can bring from previous projects, and then final, uh, also very interesting, very relevant affinity with people. Uh, I think that. If the proposal is funded, you're going to be working with these people for three, four years. Huh? So you better get along uh, with uh, with them. OK, yeah, I said uh, like uh, building your A team. Eh? Remember these guys? I think you're young researchers, but I don't know how young <laughs> if you if you know this A team uh, show. Um, but basically, it was like several characters, huh? and Hannibal was the the, the leader. Uh, he was a tactician, and and uh, he had this phrase, "I love it when plans uh, come when a plan comes together." Murdoch, he was mentally unstable, but he was the the driver of the helicopter, the the pilot. Um, yeah, Phoenix, uh, he always arranges the supplies and he's a smooth operator to, to achieve uh, when they're in problems, uh, to achieve uh, what he wanted. And then Marrakos, you, you probably know in the strength and, and yeah, he also uh, drove the van and everything. So you have to build your, your um, A team somehow. Huh? If you are uh, the initiator or the coordinator of, uh, of a project, uh, you have to make sure that you can bring all these partners that are highly complementary in terms of technologies they bring or in terms of uh, uh, background. Uh, one can be company, another university, another technical center, uh, uh, but make sure that they are very, very complementary and bring the essential uh, parts that you need for, uh, for your project. Uh, about the leader, yeah, as the final responsible, normally belongs to the organization coordinating the proposal. And my advice is that it has to be high enough uh, to be familiarized with its own organization uh, and experience in project definition, but then low enough to be able to put substantial time and effort into the process. Okay, this is a very, very time consuming uh, and resource resource intensive uh, process. So if it's a very, very, very high person, uh, he or she will probably not be able to dedicate uh, all this uh, time. Then a few uh, tips. Uh, I don't know if One, you have uh, may, time. Yeah. May I interrupt you? I have a question. Like yeah. it made in the restaurant sure. young researcher. So as a young researcher, like it's difficult to grow your CV. And when do you think also as a reviewer, like you have enough 
CV and experience that you can actually be a, a PI or coordinator of a project. And the reviewers will value that actually you, you have all the skills necessary for that. Mm. Uh, to be honest, that's something that used to be um, um, way more important before. Like, um, let's say when I started, uh, we even had a section in the proposal itself talking about the coordinator, not, not the organization, but the coordinator itself, who uh, he or she was with a picture and also explaining how good uh, this person was with uh, previous European projects, blah, blah, blah. So you were trying also to sell not only the organization, but also the person. This has completely disappeared. And I'm not saying that uh, it's not important. I mean, if you're a very, very young researcher and you I mean, you do not feel like uh, you should be doing it. Uh, uh, okay, you will not do it. But if you are at that stage where you have already uh, participated in, let's say, one or two European projects uh, as a partner, uh, ideally as a, as a uh, work package leader, right? you have some experience leading at least the, the work packets and discussing with, uh, with your uh, partners uh, in that work package and leading them somehow. I think you're ready uh, to to do it, and I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure no evaluator, uh, and I'm I'm evaluator myself uh, will um, dive into the CV of this person and say, yeah, they only have uh, he, this guy only has this Alejandro only one project and a half, he cannot make it. No, I don't think it's like that anymore. And also, I mean, it's time consuming. It's I'm not saying it's an easy task, but uh, the processes are more and more. Um, not easier, but uh, um, well, easier to deal with. Uh, the coordination used to be, uh, in my opinion, much more complex uh, some years ago. Now everything is a bit easier and you probably have at your uh, university people, support people that can help you with uh, with the coordination. So if you are at, the, at this stage, uh, I'm finalizing my answer, uh, where do you think that you are ready for it? I don't think I, I don't see why an evaluator should think that you are not. Uh, that, okay. That's my uh, that's my uh, my short uh, response. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. And if you or any of you have uh, any doubt, uh, please I, I put my my LinkedIn and my email at the end of the uh, proposal. Just feel free to drop me a line, and I can always. Uh, yeah, uh, let you know what I think. Huh? Uh, please feel free to to contact. Do you do it by uh, LinkedIn? Please send me a note to make sure that uh, I know that uh, you uh, were in this webinar. Otherwise, I, I might skip it. Um, okay, a few um, tips uh, for approaching partners. Uh, we are in the section of uh, building the consortium, so I think this is relevant. Um, it's what, what I call the kimono theory. Uh, when you call a partner, you contact a partner for the first time, you don't open your kimono like this. Hey, I have this uh, project. I'm going to uh, put I'm putting together a proposal for this very specific topic. This is my list of uh, uh, partners that are already uh, committed, and we are going to be working on this technology with these objectives. And no, you go a little bit, you open your kimono a little bit. Hey, I'm Juan. I'm working on this proposal for this very specific topic. and. We are in the early stages. Are you interested? And then the other person answers and say, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm interested. And you make a phone call. Uh, and then in the phone call, you are, uh, well, you can ask uh, if they are working on, on uh, another proposal for the same topic, if they are working with people. So you open gradually your kimono uh, uh, bit by bit, uh, and, and both of you, and you don't do it all uh, at once uh, on your side, OK? So be careful with with this, because you, you might find uh, competing uh, partners in, or partners in competing proposals. Uh, yeah, this is what I call the, the, the sh can I say shit, uh, Alejandro, in this webinar? The shitty, the crappy pattern, uh, let's call it. And this is the, the crappy partner is the one that uh, um, you call them, you invite them uh, to a project. Uh, then the first time they do not appear. Uh, then uh, the second time in the next group telecom, uh, they appear, but they are late. Uh, then you ask them to uh, provide uh, input and they don't do it, or they do it in a completely different template uh, as you required and so on. Um, so this is in the, in the proposal phase. So you can imagine how this uh, partner is gonna 
behave, how they are going to work, uh, how they are going to deliver during the project uh, phase. So uh, my rule is if it looks like crap, uh, it smells like crap and feels like crap, it must be crap, right? And uh, yeah, putting sugar in it uh, will make it a brownie. So detect these kind of people uh, that you think, uh, okay, for whatever reason, they, they, they seem to be very uh, well, you, you were very eager to involve them into your proposal, but if they are not responding, uh, you might want to add them because uh, the, the name of the institution uh, brings something to your uh, project, but be very, very careful because this is not like that anymore. I mean, you want to have people that really work on the proposal uh, and really can really deliver also during the, the project uh, phase. I will skip this, uh, this one. So uh, jumping into the planning of the proposal uh, development phase, uh, you want to do it well in advance so uh, you don't find yourself in something like this. Um, this is a, a screenshot from a, a Spanish report from the CDTI. This is like a kind of organization that helps Spanish organizations uh, partners with, uh, with European projects and many other uh, things. Uh, basically, they estimate uh, seven months. I think six, seven is quite reasonable, maybe five, five, six. Um, but yeah, you cannot read it, uh, most of you, because it's in Spanish. But basically, there's the different stages that we saw before. So you start preparing the ideas, you make a summary, you build the consortium, you make the work plan. Um, you make a first draft of the project, uh, then you share it with the partners, second draft, uh, you start working on the on the uh, finances. So you see it takes uh, a long uh, time, so you have to be uh, prepared, okay? Every uh, European proposal has typically, typically not all of them, but typically uh, these three sections, excellence, implementation, and impact. Um, my recommendation is fail fast. I mean, if you're gonna uh, put a lot of resources and by the end, almost when you're approaching the deadline, you find that uh, you're not gonna make it. Uh, okay, it's better that you make this analysis at the very beginning and uh, you make sure that you either kill your project or you go ahead and you can uh, make a, get a perfect score. Eh? If you are not convinced that you can get a perfect score, uh, don't even try. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, proposals are rated from zero to 15 points. Sometimes even 15 is not e enough. Huh? That happened to me last uh, summer. Uh, we got a proposal with a 15, which technically means that it was a perfect uh, proposal. Uh, but there were two other uh, proposals also with 15, and they find that uh, they funded the other two because the tiebreak criteria they they won in in those. Uh, okay, um, so bear in mind that the competence is very very high. So estimating roles and budgets, um, okay, which are eligible project costs? Uh, the good thing is that basically you can cover anything that you can think of, uh, which is related to the project implementation. So if you need people uh, to implement the project, you need equipment, you need consumables, you need travel, you need uh, whatever, you need subcontracting a certain uh, company that's covered. And additionally, on top of this, you get 25% of the uh, direct uh, cost, except for the subcontracting. Okay. Um, so defining partner roles. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. I think I'll skip this. Approach to uh, budget definition. Um, I normally like to. Uh, there, there's some people that ask the partners, okay, what's your estimated uh, uh, budget? And then from there, they go uh, bottom up. I like to do it top down. Eh? Uh, you have more or less, you are the coordinator or one of the core group members. You know uh, the different pieces or part and pieces of the project. So you know more or less uh, how much should be devoted uh, to each of these pieces and then who is working on each of. Uh, each of these, let's say, were packages. So you have yourself a very good idea uh, of more or less how it should uh, go. So I prefer the top-down uh, approach in general. Um, then avoid a partner budget uh, fragmentation. Uh, all the partners, you, you sometimes you see these uh, uh, work distributions where you see all the partners in all the different work packages with minor uh, participation. That's something that evaluators uh, do not like. Uh, uh, try to minimize overlaps and, yeah, in general, we adapt according to EC expectations. Be critical when people ask for money. Uh, 
Okay. And then uh, the almost the final section, writing a winning proposal. Um, I always say that all that we discussed before, the uh, the content, the, the, the scope definition for your project, and building the consortium, defining the work plan with all the tasks, all the deliverables, all the milestones, uh, defining the uh, the budgets uh, that also typically takes a lot of time. That's only half of the work. Huh? The other half is the proposal. The proposal is uh, itself the 50 pages that you are submitting and that are the only thing, the only item that the evaluators are going to see. So uh, that's what I call the 50-50 rule. The product quality is 50% that the packaging, the excellent packaging is the other 50%, the packaging that we need for our proposal. OK, uh, so I'm pretty sure these Thelma cookies, uh, uh, they are very good. But when you present them like this in this box that resembles an oven, uh, they, they look even more attractive and easier to digest by the by the consumer or the evaluator in, in our place. Since I like these marketing things uh, uh, very much, I put you another examples of marketing. These are waterproof. Uh, uh, watches that they're already submerged and I don't know if uh, this would be very sustainable today huh, to <laughs> to transport this with a liter of water there and then this is a Viagra uh, kind of uh, pill and you see also why it's a good marketing approach. Um, some thoughts about proposal writing uh, and excellence Writing an excellent proposal is a very, very uh, intensive process that requires a minimum of two, three months only for the writing. This is very important, only for the writing. If you want to make a very, very good document, you need at least a couple of months because it's not only you writing. You're going to need a lot of interactions and a lot of uh, discussion with the partners and uh, iterations. So uh, it's very optimistic to think that you can do it in, in a shorter, uh, within a shorter time uh, period. Okay, involve uh, partners early in the process as soon as possible. Follow all the forms and recommendations. So you can be innovative in the content, but not in the form. Okay, good quality images, uh, use them as much as possible because they uh, they will make your evaluators uh, happy. Uh, if they are good images and they are very powerful, very useful and expect strong competition. Uh, in general, what's the, the 11, eh? the starting uh, of uh, 11 um, for a good proposal is one that has uh, clear objectives and fits the program, uh, scientific excellence and innovation, sound impact, European dimension, high quality project management, balanced distribution of workload among the partners, clear timescale and work plans, role and com complementarity of partners, Technical but understandable language. I'll tell you in a minute why. Industrial relevance and a market a marketable uh, project uh, results. The evaluation process. This is the last section. Um, okay, this is what happens after you uh, submit your proposal. It's interesting also that you know what what comes after. Uh, so ba basically, there's an eligibility uh, check to make sure that everything is in place. Then there's individual evaluation by evaluators, typically three in bigger projects. It can be up to five. After uh, each evaluator uh, gives scores, then there's a consensus uh, meeting where they all get together and they exchange their uh, the rates and their comments, and they try to reach an agreement. Based on this, there's a ranking with, uh, okay, from the uh, biggest and the best evaluator proposal to the least, and then based on the money, they start funding from bottom, uh, sorry, uh, top down, okay? This is another way of uh, looking at it. You have your three experts, individual evaluation, then you have the consensus uh, group. Uh, they give criteria for these three sections that I showed you uh, before. And some lessons are learned. Uh, it's import important that you understand that all these five, six months that you have spending, you spend uh, building the proposal, you're going to end in a paper that's going to be uh, consulted or studied or assessed by an evaluator, I don't know where, for two, a maximum of two, three hours. Huh? And, and I know of evaluators that might do it even quicker. I tend to dedicate even more than, than these three uh, hours if I can. Uh, but um, it's very, very limited time. So make sure that uh, it's uh, very easy to read, 
uh, you have very nice uh, pictures uh, that you put things, uh, you make things easy for the evaluators because uh, they, they have many proposals to, to assess at the same time. So um, it's in your own interest to make uh, his or her life uh, easier, okay? Um, one important thing is um, also that out of these three evaluators, um, maybe one of them is very, very uh, specific expert in your topic. But then there might be a second one who is a generalist in your uh, topic, uh, but then a third one who is not even technical, maybe. Uh, it might be a consultant, it might be a business advisor, it might be a partner that's there to assess more the, the impact. Uh, so that person also needs to understand the proposal as much as possible. And of course, the very technical parts, uh, um, maybe you, you still need to keep uh, technical, uh, but the others, you should make an effort to write them in a in an understandable um, language. Okay, uh, I think that's it. And this final slide, uh, I think this idea of seeing the evaluator as a buyer is very powerful. Um, you have to think that they have very scarce time to invest in the purchasing process. They have a limited amount of money. They are in the search of uh, excellence. And the supply is much higher than demand. There's many more proposals than money available. Okay, so they're gonna be checking for um, value for money. Okay, well, this is it. Yeah. Um, just question and answers. Uh, just to let you know that there are no stupid questions. <laughs> Please go ahead. I don't know, Alejandro. I tried to make it. Yeah, 15 minutes more or less. So I don't know. If we are. Yeah over the time probably we're a little bit on the time uh, thank you very much Juan uh, for for your great talk it Welcome. was quite uh, interesting and also dynamic I have a question regarding the writing the the, the, the proposals like uh, now that it's very popular to use like uh, some uh, artificial intelligence models such as chat GPT and uh, mm -hmm. some people are using it for everything like as a reviewer, like, are you able to spot the difference when you are reading uh, these proposals and would you recommend to use them carefully I and mean, with caution and also like uh, giving some supervision, of course, or the mm -hmm. quality of the writing is something that is not so important for the reviewer, but the clarity and the conciseness. I, I do recommend to use them uh, uh, with caution. Um, I think um, even even Dario probably would say the same with, well, I don't know, uh, maybe he doesn't, uh, for paper uh, writing, because I mean, you're not going to use it. You're going to use it as, as uh, idea generation. You're going to use it sometimes for uh, English uh, uh, fine tuning. It, it helps with me. I, sometimes I give uh, ChatGPT a phrase and I do it sketchy in, in my Spanglish, huh? and I say, "Hey, put it put it in nice words." And normally, it does in a very good way. And and if I detect something wrong, I'm also able to to readapt it and iterate. Right? Uh, sometimes I. I'm uh, putting, uh, for example, uh, a list of bullets and think about something and I put like, for example, these two bullets and I say complete with three additional bullets. And sometimes it's amazing where I receive, I get of the three additional bullets, maybe two of them are very good and the other one is, uh, is crappy, so I disregard it. Uh, so I use it in many uh, different uh, parts of uh, proposal writing. I think that's something that we should not uh, uh, I mean, it's there, it's useful if you know how to use it. And of course, um, you have to iterate huh? and you know how far it can go and not just give uh, what it uh, gives you for granted and copy and paste it somewhere. That'd be, that'd be a very bad uh, practice. Uh, but just to, uh, on top of this, um, this very same week, there's an EARMA uh, conference. EARMA is the uh, European uh, Research Managers Association for Research Managers. Eh? So the kind of people that uh, puts together proposals like this. And the topic of this year is ChatGPT and how to use ChatGPT and AI uh, for proposal writing. So it, it is a topic as of today and people are really uh, using it. And of course, you need to know uh, like any new tool how to use it. Uh, yeah, yeah, and definitely I'm in favor. OK, and as a reviewer, are you able to spot the difference? And like, let's say, like you can tell the difference when someone is too fancy, the language is too fancy, like and you clearly see like it's been uh, written by some artificial intelligence and therefore you say like 
this brainstorm has not taken enough effort, has not put enough effort in the proposal, and then it's something in your mind unconsciously like, let's uh, give them one less point, something like that, or? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I, I haven't seen it yet in proposals, uh, but I've seen it in in day-to-day -day communication, for example, emails, and it looks weird. Eh? So um, I, I'm pretty sure that it would have an effect on the evaluator. So you have to make sure that uh, the, the, uh, the language is consistent, the way you uh, express yourself so that's why I, I i think it's good to use it for maybe for a first iteration but then uh, if you can give it a second iteration with your own uh, words even if they're not perfect I mean, you don't need perfect uh, language english language for for european proposal it has to be understandable uh, and very good uh, very well written uh, but it doesn't have to be perfect perfect uh, english and sometimes i agree with you this chat gpt gives you like a, <laughs> uh, like very uh, yeah weird uh, sentences so you have to be careful uh, with that yeah i think an evaluator would spot that and probably would have uh, an effect on the evaluation yeah okay thank you so we'll be ahead of the plan time i don't know if anyone else in the chat has uh, additional question if not i think i can conclude the the webinar i want to really thanks like uh professor darfarina juan perez uh, for the contribution to to the hybrid neuro consortium with this excellent talk the uh, as i said like the the webinar has been recorded and it will be made publicly available on uh, hybrid neuro uh, youtube channel so stay in tune and thank you very much for for everyone to 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 attending this webinar so thank you Thank you both for that. Thank you. Bye bye. See you in the next happy new event. Bye.